Okay, oh, thank you very much for coming to, to this talk. Uh, I'd like to thank the, uh, present the organizers of, of Voxed as well for, for inviting me. That's, um, okay. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so, um, yeah, good. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about um, complexity. I've got, a, I've got an introductory slide here, which I'm proud to say is the only slide I've ever had, which, when I first put it up, actually has, in the past, really, this is only the introductory one, driven people out of the room. Because they see these formulas and they think, this is going to be really awful. Well, it's not going to be that awful. <coughs> so, um, uh, uh, it's useful for me to start off by just saying maybe a word about myself. If this uh, clicker will work, but it's decided not to. Oh, that's bad news. Ah, it's woken up, I think. Good. Okay, so, so just, just a word about me, because it's relevant to the talk. Uh, if you've heard of me, then uh, it will be because I've written a couple of books on Java, one on Java 5 and one on Java 8, which were the kind of big introductions to um, uh, the big innovations in Java. And... The, uh, the nice thing about writing books is that, you get, is that you get a chance to talk about them. And the really nice thing about them is you get a chance to talk about them twice. Once you, once you, when you've written them, you, say, you go around and you say, this is a great book and you should read it because it's got all this useful stuff in it. And then a few years later, you go around and say, I made these mistakes when I was writing the book and this is the things you should instead learn. So what I'm going to talk about today is stuff that I got wrong. Well, not so much got wrong, but wasn't adequate, in, particularly in the first book, and actually has got uh, some uh, implications for the second one. The first book is Java Generics and Collections, and I was responsible mainly for the collections part of it, and that's what I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about today. Collections and their performance with modern hardware, which is a bit different from what it was, or what I thought it was when I wrote in 2006. And so this is the stuff about me which I think we can skip over. So, uh, I've titled the talk, um, Not Your Father's Complexity, and, and I actually I think this might be not a great idea for uh, a talk that I'm giving in Switzerland, because it's a, it's a very colloquial phrase in English, and when you say, not your father's something, what that means is, it's not the way we always learnt it. <clears throat> but I thought, actually, I could, I could um, sort of improvise on, on this title a bit and say, well, if it's not your father's complexity, what was your father's complexity? In particular, who, who, um, in, in, like, what were we thinking? thinking of, what did we think about when we thought about program complexity? Well, it's something that ever, most people have learned if you did a computing science course, and it's something you will have picked up even if you didn't. It's a mental model of program performance, or we use it as a mental model of program performance, based on the number of instructions that are executed in a, in a, uh, by, by an algorithm. <coughs> and... Uh, and it's worked pretty well. I mean, at the, time that it, at the time that it was invented, it was a pretty good model, and... I'm going to explain why that has changed and, and, how we, and how we need to change it. So this idea of uh, your father's complexity led me to think, well, I'm going to improvise a bit. Who is your father? Well, I, I'm not talking biologically. I'm talking in terms, in terms of uh, complexity. So the guy who, the, 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 the man whose name is most associated with, um, with uh, computational complexity, although he didn't actually invent the concept, is, is this man. That's Don Knuth, who's a, w one of the very greatest of the greats in computing, a creator of tech, a Turing Award laureate, uh, and the author of this epic book, The Art of Computer Programming, which is unfortunately not so much... Um, uh, not, not, unfortunately, so much studied as it used to be, but, but, but should be, because it's about the basis of uh, the, way in which we, the way in which we think about algorithms. So uh, the, uh, that introductory slide, which didn't drive you away, I'm glad to say, was actually, was actually taken from a page of that book, because he spends a lot of time in, uh, in, in the art of computer programming, working out the ex precise computational complexity of, ver of various algorithms. <coughs> Although, I always want to say that, I mean, he, he's, a, he's a really wise man. He was wise enough to give up using email after 15 years. He used it, I think, from 1975 to 1990. And at the end of that time, he said, email is for people who want to keep on top of things. I'm somebody who wants to get to the bottom of things. And if you want to communicate with him now, you've got to write him a letter. Remember letters? No, you don't remember letters. Hardly anybody remembers them anymore. So, so being a wise person, one of, the, one, of the thing, one of the things he said, which really is worth remembering, 
when we think about performance is that actually performance is not really as important, even though everyone spends a lot of time thinking about it. The key thing, that, the key thing is, a, is a line at the bottom of this slide. He says, we should actually forget about op small optimizations m about 90% of the time. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. And you've probably heard that phrase. So the, he's, he's the originator of that. So I always start every talk about performance uh, by, by saying you shouldn't care about it. And I give a lot of talks about performance. And generally speaking, everybody, people want to hear all about performance. We, we, are, we can't resist it. But most of the time, we're not, we shouldn't be concerned about it. And really, before you start worrying about the performance of your algorithms, you should go through quite a long process of analysis to ensure that, you're, that, that, the, that the, the thing that you're worrying about, the program steps that you're worrying about, really are the ones that are affecting the, the performance of your algorithm. Because generally speaking, there's a whole lot of other stuff that, I'm, that I will mention in passing in this talk that's actually, that's actually got more influence. And even, uh, even, if it's, even if the problem is with your algorithm, it's probably only with a relatively small section of the code. It's certainly only with a small section of the code. Anyway, that's just that's a kind of diversion. So let me, let, let, let me get down to the, um, the, the, the substance of the matter. What is computational complexity? So uh, the definition, I think, for, I think this is from Wikipedia, says an algorithm executing an f of n steps with time complexity O g of n will complete in less than some constant times g of n for some c in sufficiently large n. So that's kind of hard to understand when you first see it. That's the, the, the formal um, uh, definition. But in fact... The, this graph shows it a bit more clearly. If you got if f of n is the is the actual number of steps that the program is going to require for uh, increasing data size uh, along the bottom axis, and the vertical axis should say that it's the number of the number of steps, then then your uh, g of n provides an upper bound on the number of steps that can ever be required, and it's going to be a much simpler formula than the than the, than the than f of n. I mean, t f of n can be pretty complicated. For example, here's Knuth working out the number of um, steps that are required for a multiple list insertion sort. The execution time is 3.5 n squared plus 24.5 n, n being the length of the list being merged, plus 4 n for the, for the number of lists being merged, plus some constant. Now, that's, that's a formula that it's not particularly easy to work with. But actually, it's, you don't really need to work with it. The only thing you really care about is the n squared term, because that's going to, that's, as, as n becomes large, that's going to dominate all the others. And it's, it's the one that really counts. So we call this order n squared, and we don't really care about, any other, about, about the other steps. And the reason we don't is because generally what we're interested in, in, in knowing is what's going to be the effect on the execution time when we increase the size of the data. So... Computational complexity may not, tell, may, may not tell us that, but it can tell us the effect on the number of steps that are executed. So, so the reason we're interested in this is because it's the traditional way of working out whether an algorithm's any good, because it'll tell you what'll happen if you, for example, I've just chosen a, a, an instance here, double the, double the size of the data set. So the, the ones in the red uh, border here are the ones that, um, are the, are the ones that uh, we really care about. And as you can see, the, the order, I mean, I mean, everyone knows this, I guess. Uh, a constant time is the first line, and, the, and the, if you double the size of the data set, the number of execution steps will be unchanged. Order log n, the number of execution steps will have a constant added to it. Order n, it'll be doubled, and so on. We care about, we care about these four that, that are in, the red, that are in the, the red box there, because above that, we, the, essentially, algorithms are infeasible. They're not infeasible, strictly speaking. That, that's for exponential time algorithms. But in practice, say, something of order n squared, you can't work with it, because if you double the size of the data, then the, then the, uh, the, the effect of the then the effect on the execution steps is to quadruple them, and so on. And, and you, you, if you double it a few times, as often happens in modern data sets, then you're going, then you're going to have an, uh, an execution time which, which can't be used. So, so why, why, what's the connection of that with collections? Well, I always knew about this, but when I came to write the book on uh, the half of the book on uh, generics and collections, I learned something about how the collections framework was, was designed. 
So here's another candidate for, uh, for your father's complexity. It's this guy, Josh Bloch, author of Effective Java, now in its third edition, the, uh, a kind of Bible for Java programmers, and also author of the Java Collections Framework. I had some fantastically good luck when I was, um, when I was writing the book, or towards the, end of writing the, towards the end of writing the book, having Josh as a technical reviewer on the book. So this trans you, uh, if you're ever going to write anything, I mean, even if it's a blog post, always get somebody to review it. And it's a good idea to get somebody pretty, pretty rigorous to review it. So Josh was incredibly harsh. So his, his, his idea of a, kind of, of a relatively mild comment on what I wrote would be, say, this is totally false and misleading. So that would be, you know, that's, that's kind of, that was sort of mid, midway in, in, in the level of his comments. But they were extremely valuable, and they made a huge difference to the quality of the, to the, quality of the work. So one of the things that he told me, uh, one of the things he was very, very harsh about, was the fact that I had diagrams like this in the book. So this diagram, because, you know, like, I'm, I'm worried about what am I going to say. And I thought, well, there's a, if you look at the collections framework, hey, there's a lot of these abstract classes in there. And these are the abstract classes that are in the collections framework are generally only uh, package visible. And, the, um, and, and they're, they're there really to, as, a, as, an assist, as an assistance to someone who's going to develop a different implementation of the, in, of the interfaces. They're like, a, they're like a starter implementation. He said, don't talk to people about these at all. Don't, don't mention abstract collection and abstract list and so forth, because client programmers don't care about that. What, what client programmers care about is, is, the, uh, is the interfaces. And they care about... This, the, 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 it, what, he, what, he, what he explained to me was that the Java collections framework is interface-based, and you should care about and tell people about the interfaces. And once they understand the functionality of the interfaces, then, then they should choose the implementation that they want on the basis of, uh, on the, basis of the, the scenario, the execution scenario that they've got for it. So, so if you've got an implementation which is going to be particularly good at some kinds of operations, but very poor at other kinds, then that's the one you choose. But you, don't, you choose that as a secondary step from having chosen the functionality of the, of the top-level interface. Well, that works quite well for the Java Collections Framework. It's not the, 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 the Collections Framework has deviated from that ideal by quite some distance since, since then. So different implementations actually can be functionally different, like, for example, queues. The queues do behave quite different. The different queue implementations do behave quite differently. But the general idea of this, that this, this notion that you're, going to choose, that you're going to choose an implementation with the best performance for your usage scenario is really interesting. And I use, and I use this a lot when I was writing the book because I was saying, well, how are we going to choose what is the best performance? And the answer to that was, well, I'm going to say, if I'm looking, for example, at lists, I'm going to say, well, what is the yeah, the computational complexity of the different kinds of operations that each one of them does. We've got different, we've got different implementations. A list is actually a poor example because we've only got array list, linked list, and copy on write array list. And I'm going to be quite rude about linked list during this talk. And copy on write array list is kind of uh, is, is kind of off on one side because it's so poor for for. Um, for write operations, but all the same, the the, the, princ the principle still holds. So if we've got a, um, um, so if we've got these three implementations, and I've just put in uh, a little a little section of the computational complexity table that uh, that, that is uh, that I've got in the chapter of the in the appropriate chapter of the of the collections book, and then we think, well, what operation are we wanting? Uh, are we going to be maximising? What operation is going to be performed most frequently in our in our uh, in our program? And let me see if this thing's going to work. Does it work? Nah, it doesn't work. I've got I had, I had this really. Uh, I bought I bought this really fancy pointer, which is supposed to focus, supposed to give you a little thing on the screen, but ah. I saw it. I saw it briefly. Never mind. Look at the first column. Um, unless I can get this back. So, oh, there it is. There it is. I'm, j I'm, just, I'm not seeing it. Ooh. All right. This is, re this is really not going to work. I have to, st I have to stand here. So if we look at the first column here, supposing, supposing we've got um, something that... Nah, it's not going to work, is it? Nice idea. Um, look at the first column. If, you, uh, if, if your program's going to be doing a lot of random access uh, to the... Um, to the to, to your to your list, then 
you're going to care about the first column. Let's, let's, let's forget at, a, at some arbitrary index. And you can see that you've got a choice there between array list and copy and write array list. You really don't want linked list because that's order n and you've got to step all the way through the list to find it. If you're going to be adding an element onto the end of the list, then your choice is between array list and linked list because both of those are constant time. Whereas copy and write array list is uh, it's very expensive, That's the, as the name implies. It does something special when you try to write to it. But if you want to remove the first element or add the first element to the list, then in the case of, a, in the case of array list, you're going to have to shuffle all the elements up or down. And in the case of copy and write array list, then you're going to have to completely rewrite the list. But linked list is great for adding, an, for adding a cell, just an element, just at the beginning of the list. All you need to do is add on a cell and do a little bit of pointer swinging. It's a constant time operation. So it looks like these, the, so this idea of choosing the implementation for the scenario is, looks, like, looks like it's really going to work. Now, I'm obviously being a bit skeptical about it. So I've got to ask, did it ever make sense? And it does make sense if you assume that you can ignore constant factors. So, for example, the, although array list is order n for, um, for adding and removing elements from the beginning, it actually is implemented, it really is proportional. The time it takes really is proportional to the length of the list, but the proportionality constant is really small because the, the, the array copy, which it uses to shuffle the elements up, is, is um, intensified, and it's the executed machine code. So it's really fast, and it really matters a lot less that it is order n. So that was important. So the constant factors is important. Do all instructions have the same duration? Well, I mean, of course they don't. I actually found, a, last time I gave this talk, people were talking a lot about cryptocurrencies. And I just, and I just noticed this, this slide. This is from, uh, it's probably a bit of a distraction, but it's from uh, the way Ethereum operates. Is when you want to do an operation on the Ethereum uh, blockchain, then the, that operation is going to be performed by all of the machines in the, on, on the network, that all of them that are holding references to the blockchain. And so you have to pay for the operation. And you've got to pay for it in terms of the number of, um, and, and in terms, effectively, of the number of instructions that are going to be executed. But these instructions don't all cost the same. So um, you can see here that although uh, the adding is relatively cheap and doing exponentiation at the bottom of the table is relatively expensive. So, that, so they, they have a realistic estimate of the, of the idea that, um, uh, of the, the realistic assessment of the fact that operations do cost differently. And they cost differently on hardware. As well, on standard hardware as well, not only on virtual machine like Ethereum, but also, uh, for example, uh, modular arithmetic or, um, or long division is very expensive and much more expensive on all hardware than, than simple addition or bit shifting. So, so the assumption that all instructions have the same duration is a very much a simplifying instruction. Memory doesn't matter. That's, a, that's an assumption. Although there is actually something that uh, there's an idea of space complexity that's similar. But basically, this doesn't factor in memory. And that's going to be a really important uh, uh, element of this, of this talk. And that instruction execution dominates performance. And that's clearly not a, always not always a realistic uh, assumption at all. So you just have to, you just have to laugh. There's all these other kinds of things that, that, uh, that affect it, um, pr um, execution time. And those are things that actually don't have anything to do with your program, sort of not, like, like access, uh, disk access and network speeds and, and so on, and how fast the database is and so on and so on. But, but, th but these things uh, really have impact on the initial uh, quote that I gave you from Donald Knuth saying, most of the time you don't want to be worrying about this stuff. So the question, so the question naturally arises, was complexity study ever worth it? And the answer is, yes, it was. Modulo these, modulo these problems. So I won't go into them in a lot of detail. One of the things, that, one of the things I, I like to say is, it, again, it's a commonplace, but it's worth emphasizing that w even when you think what you've done has got rid of a... Of a um, uh, a, a bottleneck in your pipe, in what you might think of as your pipeline of instructions that are, that are, that are getting executed, the pipeline of data. You can get rid of you can uh, you can get rid of that bottleneck, and you think, well, everything must go a lot better. But the increased but the increased load on a later downstream bottleneck may actually make things worse. So it's not a, so th this business of optimizing performance of an entire system is quite a complex business. We're not going to look at that as a whole in this talk. We're going to look simply at the question of, of how complexity should be viewed, 
particularly for collections. So what about this, the, the, um, the question I, that's in the title of the talk, the new design of hardware? D hardware used to be a really simple thing. I mean, so it used to be, when I, when I learned about computers, and I spent a long time believing this was still the model, right, decades, the, the idea was very straightforward, that, you had, that the, your, um, your processor would um, retrieve instructions from memory, uh, then it would then, uh, on the basis of the addresses in those instructions, it would then retrieve data from memory. The, uh, the arithmetic logic unit would then process those instructions, and typically you'd, you, may, you may well have had input and output as well. But the, but the, the idea was very straightforwardly that the, that the number of that the, the mechanism for executing um, it, uh, machine instructions was simply retrieval from memory and processing in the ALU. So that was what you were interested. In. I couldn't help when I was looking at the, when I was doing uh, a bit of research for this talk, thinking about old hardware, I couldn't help putting in some of the images that I found on the, on, on the web for hardware, the way, the way it used to look. So this is, um, nobody, nobody else ever, uh, ever, ever recognizes this picture, but it's a picture from deep in my memory. They, we used to have these things called machine halls. Where the, these would be, uh, I remember the one in the first place I worked, which is maybe two or three, three times the area of this of this lecture theatre, and it was filled with these cabinets that you see there. And of course, the power of those machines all put together would be, um, would be no more than you've got on your phone, uh, in your pocket now, I guess. And uh, something else that I can't, I can't resist telling you is that when you look for the adverts for these machines, they had these things called mini computers, and, w and the advertisements for them always had the machines in a garden. I have no idea why. And they also always had an absolutely necessary accessory. <laughs> this one, this one, I had to look quite a long time before I could find one that was, you know, sufficiently, um, you know, uncontroversial to be able to show you. Because I mean, quite a lot of them, they didn't even have any clothes on. And this was the way they advertised computers in the 1970s. Anyway, anyway, it's just, uh, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't resist this. So why, so in those days, this is actually the time, pre-1980, when the uh, computer architecture was the way that I showed it. Um, this was this was uh, the golden age of what I've called the golden age of complexity analysis, B or rather, rather we saw how that happened at, at the beginning of the uh, pre-1980. Um, the the cost of the cost of memory um, was this is kind of hard to believe a dollar a byte. That's how much that mu that's how much uh, uh, random access memory cost in the 19 in the 1970s. So, so you see that the, the, the cost of um, the uh, of by the t by 1980 um, we were talking about a million dollars for a gigabyte of, for a gigabyte of memory, and you can see this is obviously a logarithmic graph, and you can see it went down. Um, it just went down really steadily on a, uh, on a logarithmic basis to, to 2010. So, so the effect of this on the way that we thought about the bottlenecks in, in programming was that uh, uh, at, this, at the left-hand side, memory was fantastically expensive. And so you had these things like external sorting algorithms. That was a big deal where, uh, where you'd have a lot of data on disk that you wanted to sort, but you couldn't get it into memory to do an in-memory sort all the time. So you'd, you'd have to take it in a, a, p a chunk at a time, sort that, put it back out again, take another chunk, sort that, and then find some way of sorting, sorting the two. So, so, so really the cost of um, the, the paging costs, the, the, the amount of time it took to get, the mem to get data down from a disk on t into, the, into memory, dominated the performance completely. In the middle of this, the, the, um, uh, in the middle of that graph, uh, memory was cheap enough to execute algorithms uh, in memory, and so, what, so, so the cost of executing an algorithm now really was to do with the number of operations. And then something went wrong. So this, this was the, the, the golden age was, the, was where the golden writing is, and something went wrong. So what happened? Well, um, the, the performance of memory, if we look at the performance of memory, it looks like this, this actually followed, a, followed a, a, a similar kind of graph. That's the, um, that's the, that's the cost. Here's, the, here's the, the, the performance. It's obviously not going up quite so, quite so well. The big, the big, the big deal, though, the the along with the reduction in the cost of memory, the big deal over this period was the increase in the 
performance of the processes. So, so the performance of memory went up a bit by a factor of 10 or so. The performance of the, performance of, uh, the processes went up by 10,000. So the processes became outstandingly the fastest part of, of a system. And bridging that gap was a, is really the big problem for computer architects from the, from the turn of the century, from before the turn of the century onwards, through the even, even th through the 1990s. So the, and the big deal is, how are we going to keep the cores hot? How are we going to keep them running? How are we going to get enough data to them? Because if memory is as slow as all of that, getting instructions and memory, f getting instructions and data from memory to the processors is now the, the overriding problem of how you're going to manage to uh, get, the m get maximal performance out of your machine. So keeping the cores running today means, looking, means a, a structure like this where you've got, uh, between the memory at the bottom and the processors at the top, you've got a series of caches. And these caches are in increasing in, uh, in speed as you go, as you go nearer to, to, the, um, uh, to, the, to the processors. And they uh, increase, by the way, in cost as well. And they decrease in, they decrease in size. And the, 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 the notion is that you're going to have a kind of a, like a pipeline of data. I'm mainly interested in data in this talk, where you've got some memory uh, loaded into the last level cache, and you've got, you've got less data loaded into the, into the level two cache, and you've got even less data loaded into the level one cache, but the level one cache is really fast. It's almost as fast as the processors. So there's relatively, provided you can make sure that the processors are working on data that's held in the level one cache, you're going to not pay an awful big price for the, um, for the, for the, for the slow speed of memory access. And a huge amount of the, of the real estate on modern chips, 80% sometimes, is given over to these caches. They're really, they're really a big deal. The, 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 it's often called the memory hierarchy, and actually everything's now positioned on the memory hierarchy, between the, um, between the processors at the top, which are, which are really fast and, and the most expensive part of the, 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 the chip, right down, to, uh, right down to virtual memory. You've got the, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the scales on the right-hand side going up, it's, it's speed goes up, power goes up, and cost goes up as well. And roughly speaking, you've got about a fourfold decrease in speed for each component as you go down the, as you go down the level. So on my laptop here, which is, which is old now, it's mid-2014, mid it's a, a Core i7 uh, Haswell, and the... The, it's, it's three gigahertz, so, there's, so one cycle on this is about a third of a nanosecond. Uh, the level one cache is about one nanosecond, so it's about three times slower. Level two cache is four nanoseconds, four times slower. Level three, 16, four times slower again. Main memory is a big jump, it's 100 nanoseconds. It's actually more than 100 nanoseconds. So you, so you see that the, the, the difference in how long it's going to take to get something up from the, um, from the, from the memory is, is a huge difference. And keeping the pipeline fed, that's making sure that these caches, that as far as possible, your processors are accessing the data that's high up in this diagram are really important. So I found, I found trying to illustrate how this, my vision of how this pipeline thing works, Works. I, found, I found this slide, which um, is a, a Mongolian stamp from uh, 1977, how they put out fires in Mongolia, or at least how they used to do. And th th my vision of, th of this is that if you think the stream is main memory, then what we're doing is, uh, is we're, we're feeding this pipeline um, going all the way to the house that's on fire, which is actually a good description of the processes. So actually, it's not, it's not entirely realistic. I, if I could go back to the Mongolian artist who drew this, I would say, could we have more people at the Riverside, uh, and slower, and then you know, and fewer people and faster near near to the fire. That would be more like the cash. But the key thing that you see about this is, that if everybody drops their buckets, which is what will happen if the data that you're that you're taking in. Uh, turns out to be the wrong data, and you have to start again and refill that pipeline, then you can tell it's going to take a lot longer for the water to get to the fire than if you could just keep, keep that going. <coughs> so sometimes I like to use... Um, because, because this, this, if I say that, the, 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 you know, that uh, main memory is 100 nanoseconds, you're thinking, well, that's really fast. You know? like, how on earth can I be complaining about that? So sometimes I like to use this analogy about... Um, 
Think of the processor as being a person boiling eggs at the stove. I, I, I use this one because everyone knows how long it takes to boil an egg. It takes about three minutes to boil an egg. So as long as, as, long as somebody gives me an egg to boil, I can, I can, uh, I can keep busy. I'm executing instructions, boiling an egg, and it, takes, and it takes three minutes to do it. So if, I, if, I, um, if I'm, not, I'm being passed the eggs by a chain, uh, along the chain of caches like this, if, as long as the pipeline is full, if they give me the wrong egg because uh, there was a misprediction about what data would be required, then, it's, then, uh, then the whole pipeline, it's a pipeline uh, spill, and you've just got to start again. So the pipeline will be refilled from the main memory, that's 100 nanoseconds, which is about 300 times longer. It's about 300 memory cycles. So that's roughly speaking 300 times 3 minutes. So instead of, instead of being able to boil an egg in 3 minutes, I'm going to have to wait for about 1,000 minutes, which is like 15 hours. Is that right? So 1,000 minutes? 3, no, that's, no, that's wrong. Um, uh, it's 300 times, you know, three, 500 times, 1500, it's a long time anyway. It's a long time to get it from the fridge. My calculation hasn't worked out this time. But, but, uh, but it, it, usually it's the way that I figure it is. It's going to be many hours for the, for the eggs to get from the fridge to me. Didn't work quite well. So, um, so, th so the, the cost of, the cost of uh, cash misses can dominate, can completely dominate your program execution time. And in fact, they frequently do. So hardware architects spend a lot of time thinking, trying to think their way through about how to, in how to ensure that there won't be cache misses. It's a big uh, measure of how good a piece of hardware is that the, for standard benchmarks, that, it will, that, the, that the cache misses will be relatively low. So the main memory retrieval is two or three hundred times to get it from, to get it from the... Um, uh, to get data from the main memory is going to be 100 times level one cache. That would be, that would be five hours on my, uh, on, on, on my analogy. And uh, two or three hundred times the, the register access. So if it's a register access would be uh, ten hours. Typical programs have very high hit rates because the hardware designers have thought really hard about how to do this stuff. But the other 5% makes a really big difference because the costs are so high. So where do the cache misses come from? And the answer is that there, there are a number of there are a large number of reasons. But one possibility is that you've just not got sufficient uh, capacity in the cache. Another one is that you might have a failure of prefetching. So I'm going to look at both of those in a, in a minute. Let me look at the second one first now in terms of explaining it, because you, if you don't know what prefetching is, it, it wants a, a moment's explanation. The uh, the incapacity of the cache, insufficient capacity, is more obvious. So the way that prefetching works is the hardware predicts where you're going to be wanting to, um, where you're going to want the data from, and it loads it into the caches in advance. So the, the idea of it's really, really quite straightforward. The implementation is not straightforward. Here we've got a picture of the, of the level one cache, only the level one cache shown on this. These are, um, the, the, the horizontal lines are, uh, ca are what are called cache lines. They're units of the level one cache store. So typically they're 64 bytes. And a very important thing to know about them is that they get loaded as a lump. You, d you, can't use, you can't say, oh, I just want a couple of bytes. Could you load that into level one cache? Anything that's going to be loaded into level one cache will be 64 bytes at a time. So, so I, I've drawn a rough kind of correspondence. Different bits of the level one cache correspond to different bits of memory. And now I imagine that we're, that we're doing something like an array access. So we're regularly stepping along an, an array like that. And then, it, then the hardware can, there are quite good algorithms in the hardware observing the memory locations from which data is being retrieved. And they say, ha, huh, I can tell where that's going to come from next, what's going to be wanted next. And, and, it, can, and it can prefetch that data in, in, into, the, into the cache. So, so that works fine for, like, uh, for simple array um, accesses. But that's not what we're doing most of the time in Java. And this is where collections are particularly relevant, because in an object-oriented language, what you're actually doing is you've got these data-dependent loads. You're following references all the time, or pointers. Well, sorry, pointers, but references, as we like to call them. And so, so, you, so, so you're leaping around in the, in the, in the memory here. And there's no, the hardware doesn't have a chance to, to do this prefetching. It has no idea where you're going to want your next data from. And therefore, the pipeline has to be completely refreshed each time. It's actually even worse than that, because the memory is divided into, into pages, typically 4K. And, th and because the processor works with virtual addresses, that is, with a, with a page index and a displacement within the page, it doesn't have absolute addresses in memory. 
And there's, there are many reasons for this, but the strongest possible reason for it is security. It ensures that the, the no process can ever access a page that doesn't belong to it. So that's, that's, that's the kind of overriding reason why most, uh, I think, or m all common hardware uses virtual addressing. So it's got to translate this virtual addressing into the, the virtual addresses into absolute addresses. It uses a table for that, of course. Uh, the table, of course, is held in, a, it's held in fast cache. Uh, and then, and this does this does the translation and works out um, where the where where the absolute address is of data that's to be retrieved. But the problem about this, as you can see, is that the these th this 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 uh, table, which is called a translation look aside buffer for some reason, or more commonly just a translation buffer. This, of course, itself is in cache, and of course, it's the the, trans the translation buffer as a whole has to be in has to be in memory, and so the bit that's loaded into the, um, the, sorry, the page table has to be in memory. So the bit that's loaded into the translation buffer uh, is relatively small, and that will have to be refreshed. So it may be that for every memory access, you're going to have to, act for, uh, in the case of data-dependent loads, which are jumping about between pages, you're going to have to load, um, not, not, you're going to have to refresh the caches not once, but twice. This is very expensive. Okay, so let, let me, um, let me uh, go a bit faster, because I'm... Uh, not really got to the meat of the talk yet. That's a bit bad. How does caching play with complexity? Well, uh, what, we're going to do, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a really simple case of traversing a list. It's obviously order n. Um, and I'm going to compare linked list with primitive array. Sometimes when I give this talk, people say, why are you talking about linked list? The answer, um, the answer is because linked list is particularly bad. But I'll show you why array list is actually not an awful lot better. So here's the result of doing some... Um, of, j of doing a, a JMH uh, analysis of a, of a, a simple benchmark, simply um, traversing a linked li link list with this number of elements. So 1K, there's going to be four columns, 1K, 7K, 63K, and 511K elements. And the performance in nanoseconds per operation is, goes down really dramatically right o over that. So, we, so we've got reasonably good performance. Seven nanoseconds for each operation. An operation is like moving a step down on the list. Um, and it goes up for 511, um, for 511K it goes up to nearly 30. This, this, uh, this was run on a, uh, on a machine not unlike the, the, my, my laptop, but not actually my laptop. So the, the, the CPI, which is the clock ticks per instruction, is the, is the, the way the hardware engineers rate how, how well their hardware is doing. And that decreases quite radically, or quite radically over this. That, this accounts for why the performance is so poor. Clock ticks per, in, per instruction, it's the inverse of instructions per per cycle, is the, um, is, is the, the hardware measure. The, the fundamental measure of how well your hardware is doing. So it, it can be more than one because we have instruction level parallelism. And, and we're, we'd really, sorry, it can be a lot less than one. The number of instructions executed per cycle can be a lot more than one. So we're going from a lot more than one to, to, to less than one here. Uh, and if we look at the events per operation, then th we're going to see really what happens. First of all, the, the, the number of cycles, the number of machine cycles per operation is going up. The way, the, way that, um, the way that we would expect. The number of instructions being executed stays the same. So the, this, this line is the one that, is, that defines why the, the whole point of my talk here. We've got the, this is an order n operation. The number of instructions is remaining the same all the way through. But what is happening is, is if, we, if we go down and we look some more, we see that level one cache misses is going up hugely. It doesn't, it doesn't actually, it's still not very many, um, but it's, but, it, but the, a small increase in level one uh, cache misses, because of what I said earlier, if, because each miss is so expensive, the pipeline may have to be completely refilled, that, they can, can, that they've completely come to dominate the, uh, the performance. So there's some, other, there's some other things here. The last level cache also, um, the, the misses in, on that go up as well, in a, in a similar kind of way. That's the bottom level cache. So we can see this, this is not a cache-friendly program. <coughs> so that's, link, that's linked list for you. Um, what's going on here? The linked list is uh, a, a node size is 24 bytes, and here I'm adding together the um, I'm adding together not only the the size of the the cells in the linked list, but also the amount of the amount of space that the, that the data is taking up because we, it's a linked list of integer, and each integer 
takes up takes up four bytes. Sorry, 16 bytes, 16 bytes. So, so, so uh, the node size is 24. The, the, the total overhead of, the, um, of adding another element to the linked list is 40 bytes. And the level one cache on the, on the machine that this was run on ha had a capacity of 32K. So, so the, um, the level one cache was going to be blown out really early on, and you're just going to need to keep on refilling it. And that's why the big list uh, is so much more expensive than the, than, than the small one. And the reason why array list is really not an awful lot better than, than, than linked list is because, it, because the overhead of adding an element, even though, of course, an array list only takes the, the, uh, is a, the pointers and the, in the actual array of the array list only take four bytes, the, the integer objects, the, the integer objects that it, uh, that it needs those take another 16. So, so, the, so the total overhead is 20 bytes. So, so this is actually not as bad as a linked list, which, is, which has 40 bytes for each element. But the fact is, you're going to uh, you're gonna blow the cache pretty early on anyway. Compare this with, the, with an array of primitives, and you see something completely different. So the, the number of instructions, again, is, 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 is constant. The level one cache misses hardly starts to get off the ground uh, for the 511k array. And you see, if you look at the top line now, the performance, the performance is pretty constant. So, so the, the, the key thing here is that we're not loading the memory with all these big objects that Java requires, even to store, even to store a, a, an int. So that's one of the problems. We may just run out of cache. Here's another problem, which is, um, which is the data locality. So you may have heard, you may have heard of this term. Do we man are we actually managing to, match, uh, to keep our data compactly in memory in a way that matches what we're going to need on the, in, in the caches? So it's, it's quite possible, for example, that you'll intersperse your, the data that you need with data that you don't need. And when, when you load a 64-byte cache line, you're taking a lot of stuff you don't need. And so you're going to need to refresh that line earlier. Uh, I mean, another possibility is that... Um, that you may not be, you may be frustrating prefetching in the way in the way that I talked. So, um, so I, I, I ran a little experiment, which which I'll which I'll show you briefly here, where we um, populated a, a linked list. I, I, I populated a linked list in what I call a natural way. It's just it's just my term, uh, and the idea of that is that you just um, the you execute the code that there is there that we have below there. And effectively, the, 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 the cell nodes and the data are interspersed, and they'll be required in a way that actually, that, that if, you, if you traverse the list, you'll be, you'll be uh, accessing the data in a fairly natural way. Uh, the alternative is what I call uh, populating the linked list randomly. So, so for that, first of all, I created and populated an array list of integers, so the pattern looks like this. So we've got a long, a long array with some, with some data at the end of it. And then I, I created a linked list, which I allocated, and I allocated the pointers to the, I populated that with, with data chosen from random places in, in the, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, data that I've created there. So, so, so there's going to be no, that's going to pr frustrate prefetching completely. And now I've got a little demo, which, um, which I, 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 I used to try to run JMH programs um, as part of the as, as, as part of presentations, but you can't realistically. Uh, oh dear, and I can't even run this. What happened there? Um, you can't really. Uh, no, I'm, you're not. You're not going to see it. That's so frustrating. Well, it'll it'll certainly shorten the talk a bit. One last try. Ah. We're not, it's, how frustrating is that? Sorry. Well, okay. So it's just a JMH program anyway. And the and the speed, the, the difference in the performance of those two. Oh, it's it's running on here. So did it run? Is it running? Is it going? Looks like it. It wasn't running on my, it wasn't running on my display. Now it's stuck. How frustrating. No good. Not not moving. No, oh, it's gone. For, uh, the the difference in performance was was great, so that that's unfortunate. I, it's, I made a film, I made a video of the of the JMH demonstration because you can't do you can't run a realistic experiment fast enough in a in a demonstration. So usually that uh, usually that demonstration works, but not on this occasion, obviously.
The demo gods weren't with me. But the, 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 dif the difference, the difference was, is, is very great. It's like a factor of five, a factor of five difference. Just because of the way that the data, they're doing exactly the same operation, both order n, just traversing a linked list. There's no difference in the functional, in the functional behavior. There's a huge difference in the performance. I can't help saying, you know, just in case you're thinking, well, I'm, I'm really banging on linked list, that um, it's not really, uh, nobody really loves linked list very much. It doesn't get a very good press. <laughs> But, in, but uh, and, and the, reason, the reason is, I mean, I never used to understand this, the reason that nobody really likes it very much is because it's doubly linked, and, and therefore each element takes a lot of memory, and it's this memory that's so expensive. It's not expensive because memory is really cheap, and people think, oh, I don't care about that. But if, the, but if the elements of the data structure take up a lot of memory, then it's going to, um, then it's going to, then it's going to push your... Uh, it's, going to, it's going to frustrate the, the, the cache coherence, and that's really going to impact on your time. So I'll skip the, the stuff to do with the hash map. I, I will just, I'll just say that um, the hash uh, the, what people think is the problem with hash maps is, the, um, is overflow. Because, because if you get, um, if you get uh, collisions in a hash map, then, then you get overflow on the bucket chain. And then effectively you're, going, you're reduced to some linked data structure. The, um, where it used to be that in hash map overflow would lead to a linked list structure. In nowadays, in modern hash maps, in Java 8 onwards, it leads to a binary tree, but, the, uh, but, the, the, but it's still, they're linked structures, and linked structures are the thing that really causes problems with hashes. The immutable collections that have arrived in, uh, in, in uh, Java 9 are an improvement on this, and actually one of the things I'm suggesting is that you might be able to, um, you might actually be able to do better with, if, with a, uh, say, a, a, a map or a set that you're going to be reading a lot more frequently than you're writing, is that once you've assembled it, it's actually m moving it into an immutable collection. Because immutable, the way that immutable collections are structured means that, means that they will typically be much more, they're populated at the same time. If you do it like this, they're populated at the same time as they're, um, as they're created, and the data will be stored all in, in the same place. So, um, reducing memory footprint is obviously a way of improving this problem about cache, about, uh, cache friendliness. There's th these third-party collections frameworks, which I don't really have time to talk about in any detail, uh, all of them attempt to reduce memory footprint. They don't generally uh, concentrate on this issue of cache friendliness. Where they have primitive collections, it's a different matter. So it, you can improve data locality rather than improving memory footprint with primitive collections, like I showed you with that array of, with that array of integer. So there are better options with that. Um, there's the, any, anything that... Uh, many, of these, many of these collections frameworks do improve... Uh, do, do support primitive collections and therefore do improve data locality. People that are focused on this in particular are people who, for example, are working with bit sets rather than, uh, or, or bitmaps rather, uh, rather than objects. So this uh, roaring bitmaps have some very clever algorithms for, uh, for, for, making, for getting very good data locality. Object layout is a, is a third party library which um, developed actually by Martin Thompson and Gil Tenney, who are people who are sort of centrally involved in thinking about this. And that, um, and, and that provides some C-type structures, e effectively. Very good for data locality, but unfortunately they don't have the function of collections at all. So a lot of the answer will come with Project Valhalla, which will appear in Java something, where the idea of that is to have value objects which will essentially have the um, which will essentially have the property they'll behave like objects but they'll be organized in in in, in memory like primitives so they'll be implemented like primitives so that's a really difficult uh, that's a, a really difficult uh, goal it's very ambitious and they're making good progress on that and that they're addressing this problem with project valhalla but it's probably some time away so the conclusion, my conclusion of sorts is, well, uh, of course, performance mostly doesn't matter. When it does matter, it really does. Every performance improvement represents a trade-off, of course. You know that. Algorithm complexity is still important, but so are all these other things. Database, network and database performance, GC, resource contention, and caching. So, in fact, it, it is your father's complexity. It's just got a lot more complex. Thank you. <laughs>